some strange verses in the Bible. Sometimes you read just one verse and it seems quite obscure and out of place. And I, I read one this week and I thought, man, that's, that's quite a, like it's just such a thing almost said flippantly in passing. But there's nothing in Scripture that is not intended for our good and for our use. And so I, I just try to kind of try to pay attention to one little verse and it's in Judges chapter 3. Uh, verse 31, and we'll put it up. And Judges is probably not a book many people kind of delve into, but it is a super, super interesting book, and there's a heck of a lot in there that we can learn from it. But Judges chapter 3, verse 31 reads like this. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. And you're like, man, that is such an obscure verse. It is just, it's weird to be in there. And Looking at it, there's not much else about Shamgar. There's a, he's mentioned again in chapter 5 where it says in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, the, people, the roads were deserted and, and people took the winding ways. And I was like, that's even more obscure. But I had a look at this guy. And, and you know, Shamgar ended up being one of what they called the judges of Israel or the leaders of Israel at that time. And there's, there's nothing else that we can find out about this guy biblically but we can find out a few things about him looking at some other stuff. So Shamgar was uh, a name that was not a Jewish name. And son of Anath. Anath was one of the gods of a different religion. And that son of Anath kind of means, he, like it wasn't literally his dad's name or his mom's name. It probably meant that he came from a people that worshipped that god. Or he was a warrior of that kind of religion. That's also what it could mean. So it's getting more and more obscure as we read this thing. And then you're like, 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Not many people have ox goads nowadays, so I had to look up what is an ox goad. And effectively, it's a long pointy stick. That's what he's got. It's like an eight-foot ox goad. They used to poke the oxen with it to get them to move. And he killed 600 Philistines. Some of them, they might have been tipped with metal. But effect effectively, this chap who's not Jewish took a long pointy stick and killed 600 Philistines and led the nation. You're like, it's, it's not getting any clearer, Mark. Like, help me out here. This is getting more weird. But Shamgar was a completely unlikely candidate to lead the nation. He wasn't, as far as we can tell, wasn't from a major tribe of, uh, of Israel, might not have even been Jewish altogether, probably converted or became Jewish, maybe. We're not really sure. Scholars disagree on it. He... Um, didn't have the right tools to become a military leader. It's not exactly the kind of thing where you'd see someone and you'd be like, yes, that's our guy. He's going to fight for us with his long pointy stick. You go, Barry. You, you're out in front. 600 Philistines. That's a lot. Who didn't come from the right place. Didn't hold any political sway. Wasn't from the right family. You know, he didn't have all the right standing. For all intents and purposes, he should never have been a judge of Israel. He had nothing with him. He had nothing behind him to say, man, this is our guy. This is the one we want to lead. So what, what did he have? But if, if we look at Scripture, you know, God often chooses the most unlikely candidate to be the one to lead. And you can see it all the way through Scripture. Moses, he had anger issues. He was impatient. He eventually is like, he had excuses, I can't, I can't preach, I can't talk, maybe you should pick someone else, Lord. And God says, no, no, I want you to be a liberator and a nation builder. How about Abraham? Man, he was old, he tried to circum circumvent the, the, the promises of God, he was sterile, and God says, I'm gonna, no, no, you're going to be the father of many nations. Or Joseph, this young man who has incredible dreams, who's immature and arrogant, Im also God makes him wait long. But God says, are oh, you going to be a prime minister of the second most powerful nation on earth? And you're going to be a savior to two nations based on the wisdom I'm going to give you. David, the forgotten son in the wilderness, a poet and a singer. And God says, you're going to be a uniter of my people and a military leader like no other. Jeremiah, you're too young. Don't know how to speak properly also. And God says, I'm going to make you a prophet to the nations. Peter, brash, violent uneducated. I relate a lot to Peter. God says, leader of the gospel to the nations. Paul, a murderer, a legalist, an enemy of God, enemy of God's church. And God says, you're going to be an apostle to the people that don't know me. 
right down all the way through Scripture, and even most importantly in our examples, to Jesus. Born to a nowhere family in the back end of a small nation in very little fanfare and ceremony. Nobody really knew except some shepherds. They renounced it to some shepherds, and they're like the dirty people, and we don't really listen to them. And that's who God chooses to send his angels to and announce it to. And God says, you're going to be the savior of the world. You see, for all those examples, and we can go on and on and on through Scripture, almost every person you look at, Gideon, back end of nowhere, mighty warrior. Sorry, what? I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I'm harvesting, Lord. Don't know about this warrior fighting thing you've got going on. God says over and over again, He's going to use that. And you know, you know what's interesting? When you look at all of those people, they're all broken, pretty useless, not really up for the task. But the thing is that God uses broken and imperfect people over and over again because that's the only kind there are. And I want to say to you this morning, if you feel like, man, I am useless. I, I don't know if God can use me. Maybe, I'm, maybe you feel like you passed your cell by date. You still got a bit, a bit to go on the best before, but you're past the sell-by date. But you're feeling like, I, you know, I don't have the right education. I don't, I, you know, I, I haven't been churched. I haven't been this. I've never done, never planted a church. I've never gone into a nation with friends. God can still use you because God uses broken and imperfect. Maybe you think, man, I've been too hurt. I, I, somebody did something to me and I'm, I'm broken inside because of that. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a whatever it might be. And you think, man, I can't do that. I've committed too much sin. Friends, God can forgive and use broken and imperfect people because that's the only kind there are. We don't need to be useful for God. We need to be useless and allow Him to use us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes this from verse 25 to 31. He says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not exactly great encouragement and uplifting talk and like a, a great, like he's pretty much saying you, you were all pretty dumb. You're all pretty useless when God called you. He said, not many of you were wise and noble. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, what Paul is saying is that God doesn't use the wise, the perfect. He doesn't need you to be that. He can use you if you are that. But you don't need to be that to be used of God. God uses those who are available, not those who are perfect. Will you be available for God? Paul carries on in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. He says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Paul is saying what makes us useful for God is our inadequacy. The very fact that we are inadequate to do a job means that we must rely on God to get that thing done through us. If you can do something in your own strength, you don't need God. If you, if you look at, if God says to you, I want you to go and be generous and go and bless someone, and you look at your budget and you go, right, I got 15,000 rand in my savings account, which is like I've got, it's saved, it's separate, it's not I need to live on, I can easily go and give a thousand rand to someone and go, hey, there you go, God bless you. And it might be uncomfortable, it might be like, oh, I feel like I'm doing good. But it doesn't require a lot of faith, does it? But if God says, I want you to take half of your monthly income and give that away, that's going to require a leap of faith. Because then you're going to go like, hey, like I've got, I got bills to pay. I've got things coming off. Like, they don't ask. They just take it every month. How am I going to do that, Lord? You've said, so we've got to, when we want to be useful for God, our inadequacy means that we have to rely on God. See, when Peter got out of that boat to walk on the water, he had never walked on water before. He knew he was inadequate at water walking. But he kept his eyes on Jesus. And as long as he did, he was fine. And he said, if it, 
if it is you, call me and I'll come. And Jesus says, Peter, come. Peter doesn't just get out of the boat presumptuously. He waits and he hears the word and God speaks to him and then he goes. But he knows he's inadequate to do that. He's got to rely on Jesus for that thing. And he's like, if you're doing it, I'm doing it. I was about 13 or 14 and we went on, on a, a holiday out to Midmar, Midmar Dam. Um, some of you have been there recently and it didn't work out so well for you. But uh, mine wasn't as bad as yours, Luke. But uh, it was a day not, uh, it was pretty much similar to this sort of day. It was a summer, but it was like, it was a cold, rainy day, as only like the Midlands can be in summer. And I was, I was about 13 or 14, and we got there, I was just with my parents, and we decided for some reason, I managed to convince my dad to hire a windsurfer that day, and you could hire from Ezenvelo at that stage, I think. I don't know if it was from the Yacht Club, I, c I can't remember the details. And I had never windsurfed in my life, but I'd watched Trans World Sport and Gillette World Sport special enough to know how to do it. It's a bit of a, I just aged myself there, but okay. But if, so I got this thing, and it was a big clunker of a windsurfer board, and I had to figure out how to put the sail up and everything, and dragged it down from the office down to the dam. And it was cold and rainy, but I was determined. So in my boardies, my baggies just got on this thing and tried for hours on end. I, I, it must have been at least two and a half hours that I was going on this thing. And I was finished. I was tired. And, I, and the wind was blowing. So I thought, this, you know, this, must, this is how it is. And I had, I would get up on the thing and I could balance. And, but I was just, ended up getting blown into this cove in the reeds. Drag it out, pull it all the way up the beach again, push it out, go again on the thing. And I was a, like, I was a skinny little 13 year old. I wasn't a big guy. So it was like a lot of work blown down back into the corner of the cove in amongst the reeds and getting reeds in my feet as I was walking out. But I was determined to figure this thing out. I was a stubborn lighty. But after about two and a half hours, this guy came walking down, just other people who were picnicking there. And he was, I, I can't remember, he must have been like in his 30s or so. And he had shorts on, but he had one of those, I'll never forget, those blue, navy blue dry mac jackets on. You know those ones, those, like the little like lining inside, the little white lining inside, cheap, cheap. They didn't really, they worked for like the first three and a half minutes of a rain if it was light. And he had this on and he said, hey, do you want me to show you how to do this? And I was like, yeah, yeah, please help me out, buddy. And he said, right, what you got to do is you grab this handle in the front. I'm like, oh, I didn't notice that there. And you hold that and then it like aligns you with the wind and then you, you stand on this side and you hold it and like how you lean. And he showed me and I was like, that's amazing. This is so much information. I'm going to crush this. And he said, watch here. And he and he was in like knee deep, it wasn't even knee deep water for him. And he went and, he, and so he said it and he stood up on this thing and I thought, oh, that are going to fall in the water in his jacket. And off he went, out on the windsurfer, jaw, he went like 200 meters out, turned around, shoo -shoo, around the front of the thing, just like I'd seen on TV, back in, all the way up onto the beach and stood on dry land. I was like, this thing might be my hero. And he said, there you go, that's all you do, just hold it like that, turn there and then turn into the wind and lean it a bit. I was like, that's amazing. This is brilliant. It was another hour and a half of in the reeds, back up the beach. In the reeds, back up the beach. I never ever learned to windsurf. The story doesn't have a happy ending. And many of us are like that, friends. You see, we are not, many of us are like that with our lives. We want to operate our lives. There's nothing wrong with the wind. I thought, initially I thought, man, this board is old. There's the wrong, wrong sail for it. Clearly, this thing's not working. These oaks have, this thing doesn't work. It's broken. The windsurfer itself is broken because uh, I've seen it on TV and this isn't how they go on TV. But there was nothing wrong with the, with the tool. It was the operator who was faulty. There was someone who was a better operator who knew what to do. And in life, so often that's how we are with our lives. We think we are sufficient to run our lives and we want to be in control of our lives. And most of us are just going to white knuckle it and tough it out until we get it right. It doesn't matter how often it goes wrong. But friends, I want to say there is someone who knows how to run your life better than you do. There's someone who knows how to operate your life. They know you better than you do. And they know what's best for you. I want to challenge you today. Will you let go and let God lead your life? Will you get to the point of on your knees before God and saying, Lord, have your way with me. Not my will, Lord, but, Lord, but yours be done. Because I promise you, it is far better when God leads than when you do. It looks good to everybody else around you. They're like, that's what it should be like. You shouldn't be thrashing about and falling off and in the reeds and out and up the bank and covered in mud. It should look nice and graceful. That's how our lives should be. 
And if we will allow God to lead us, if we will become useless at leading our own lives, God will make us useful for Him in His kingdom. Paul knew that he was inadequate for the task that God had for him. He knew that there was not enough in Paul that would accomplish what God wanted to do with him. God had a massive, massive task for Paul. He had to rely completely on God. So he gave who he was at that time completely over to the Father. And you know what the Father did? He took a murderous Saul, changed him to Paul, and used him to change the world, change the course of human history, write half the New Testament, plant churches through the, most of the Mediterranean and, and Asia Minor and into Europe because he was willing to be useless for God. Didn't matter what people thought of him. Didn't matter what people said about him. Paul said, I know what God has called me to. I know who he is and I know what he's calling me to. And he relied on God over and over again. He became useless for God. Mark Batterson, speaking about Shamgar, says this, this verse in Judges. He says, it doesn't matter whether you're a journalist, a teacher, an entrepreneur, an artist, a politician, or a lawyer. What matters is that you are using your ox goad for God's purpose. Don't just make a living. Make a life, make a mark, make a difference. You don't need to change jobs. You don't need to change circumstances. You don't need to change friends or change spouses. Please don't. You need to change you. You need to change you. You need to change you. You see, all of us want to see a world changed. We want to see our society changed. We want to see our region and our nation changed. But none of us want to change. We always expect everything else to change, but none of us want to start with us. Like Michael Jackson said, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. What is the ox code that God has put in your hand? What is that sharp pointy stick that you think, man, this thing is just for prodding cattle. That God says, wait, hang on. That's the thing I'm going to use. That's the very thing I'm going to use to slay the Philistines, not because of the ox goad, but because Shamgar had had enough. And he stood up and he said, man, enough of these Philistines raiding us and attacking our people. I'm going to slug 600 of them. And God says, that's a man I can use. That's a man I can use. And he led God's people. Amazing. He was effectively a herd boy, maybe a herd man. And God used him to lead a nation. You are one decision away from a totally different life. You know that? And that decision is, will you follow Jesus all out? Will you completely give your life over to him? Not half-hearted, not adding him into your life, going, Jesus, come along for the ride. It would be nice if you could make things comfortable and easy for me every now and again but absolutely laying everything down and saying, Lord, I've had enough of leading. I'm tired. I need you to lead. Choosing to go wherever he sends you, to, choosing to, to use whatever the ox goat is and be useful for the kingdom and the king. So how do we do it? Just quickly, I've got two things and then I'll finish off. Make a choice to change you. It starts today. And if you don't get it right today, there's also today, tomorrow. Tomorrow becomes a new day. And by the way, there is no getting it absolutely right. Every day you're going to need to work on it. And you know the beauty of, you know, God wasn't unaware of that. And he writes over and over again that each new day we start with God, we make that choice again. Lamentations 3.23, right in the middle of the book of Lamentations, this great outcry of the pain and suffering of the nation, right in the middle, the hinge verse says there are, that God's compassions and mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. In the midst of our suffering and pain, can we choose to follow God? Zephaniah 3.5, I often quote this. Morning by morning, not really, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he does not fail. Morning by morning, he dispenses his justice. And every new day, he doesn't fail. God is new. God's mercies are new every day for us, friends. If you feel like, man, I, I messed up yesterday. God says, my mercies are new every day. Will you follow me? Will you give up? Will you be useless for me today so that I can make you useful? So many of us want to do it in our own strength and then try and, and God says, no, no, no. Let me use you. And that might be very different to how you want to do it. So one is just realize that his mercies are new every day. You see, the enemy wants to discourage us. He loves to drag up the past, doesn't he? You ever had those 
those accusations come at you, yeah, but remember what you did there. You can't go and tell that person Jesus loves him. Remember what you did there. That's not your, they're going to see through you. God says there's no condemnation. Forgiveness is complete and ongoing. Don't let the history stop you from your future. The second thing, ignore the attacks of the enemy. One thing he does is accuse us. His name is the accuser, the enemy, Satan, devil, that's what he's called. So he'll bring up those things. But the other tactic of the enemy is when he can't beat us with that stuff, is he overwhelms us. He just like sends the ants. You know, an ant can't take out a, a cricket, but like 600 ants can take out a cricket. You ever watch them? They just swarm all over the thing and it can't jump a bit. And that's what, sometimes what it feels like what the enemy is doing is he just overwhelms us with discouragement. And I want to say to you, if, if that's you, don't worry about living for next week or next year because that's often where the discouragement comes when it comes to being all in for God. My dad gave me a great thing, and it comes from Dale Carnegie, but it actually comes from a chap called Sir Oswald something. I didn't write his name down. I forgot it. But he after, uh, traveled on a, on a ship across the ocean, and uh, he traveled across... I think from England to America to give a speech, and he noticed on the ship that the ship bulkheads had watertight compartments, so they had doors that could shut and seal off compartments from one another. Obviously, it's a, it's a protection thing so that if the ship hull gets pierced, they're still able to just contain the leak into one section. And so Dale Carnegie took this teaching into, and, and um, that this guy did at a speech, and called it into daytight compartments. Live in daytight compartments. So you live in a, a compartment where yesterday's troubles stay in yesterday. And we go, that's fine. It happened, but it's in yesterday. We don't let that leak into today and into tomorrow. Otherwise, it's going to sink the ship. We live in daytight compartments. And it's, it's Trish's, yes, that's a bit overwhelming. But I think it's become a psychological tool that uh, it has, eh? Has it become a psychological tool that psychologists use? Do you use it? Okay. Pseudo-psychologists use this tool to help people cope with trauma in their lives. So that what happens is we acknowledge it and keep it there, but it lives in a daytight compartment. So we don't keep bringing that thing with us everywhere we go. We don't allow that water to leak into every compartment of the ship. And you know why it's such a good thing? It's because it's biblical. <laughs> Most of the the wisdom and the things that we've come up with that are really good and helpful for us are actually biblical. Because Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6 in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, seek first the kingdom in, in, in 6.33. And then in 6.34, he says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to worry about itself. He's saying, live in a daytight compartment. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, Romans 14.8, Paul says, if we live, live for the Lord. And if we die, die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. He's saying it's not, don't worry about the things that you can't control. Worry about now. Live for the Lord now. He's not saying be flippant with your future. He's not saying ignore it and don't plan for it. He's just saying don't worry about it. Don't let that consume everything that happens today. See, the enemy wants to drag up the past and accuse us or discourage us with the future that isn't going to happen. And Jesus says, will you be available to be used now? You want to be useful Acknowledge your inadequacy and be useless for Jesus. Commit today to do everything that you can for the Lord. And do everything that you do as if you were doing it for Jesus. Whatever that is. Whether you cut grass, clean a house, make a bed, make a meal, change an organization, make decisions that are going to affect thousands of people's jobs. Whatever it is that you do, save lives. Do it as if you're doing it for Jesus. It is the most fulfilling way to live life. You know, I worked for many years in property. I worked for a family that had a, a fairly large property portfolio, and I managed that property. And I called myself a property manager because that was quite a nice title. But I started out fixing toilets and roofs. That's literally what I fixed, often. I can't tell you how good I got at replacing toilet systems and internal systems. I had a postgraduate qualification and 20 years, uh, 15 years of work experience. And here I am, fixing toilets and sealing roofs. And I didn't care. 
because I worked for Jesus. I used to get sunburnt on those roofs in weird places because your shirt pulls up and it's uncomfortable. And there I am, sealing roofs in summer in Rustenburg. Well, and, and it could quite easily have got, I could quite easily have got upset. I mean, like, Lord, what am I doing here? Like, I'm wasting my life. I'm, like, I've done all the studying. I've got all this. But it was a beautiful thing. I was happy. I was content because I worked for the Lord. I was like, I don't know how this is useful for you, Jesus. But you know, one day, a tenant, one of the tenants called me into his office. And I had never spoken to this oak about church or anything. I'd ne- not overtly. And he called me in. And there I am in my, I'm literally in like work clothes. He was a um, branch manager for a, a large blue chip company. He called me and he said, Mark, I'm struggling. I was like, hey, what do you need, buddy? Is it the DB board again? Is the keys are tripping? What's up? I got you, bro. And he's like, I've cheated on my wife and I don't know what to do. Oh, I wasn't ready for that. Uh, I don't know if I've got the toolbox for that. <laughs> and this like just broke down and started crying in front of me in the office. And it was an incredible opportunity to lead that guy to Jesus. Marriage was... Restored through a lot of work. God did incredible work in that man's life. And I was just there. I just happened to be the ox goad at that moment that God used. Will you be available for God? Will you be useless in every situation so that God can make you useful for the kingdom? Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do and He will establish your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and He'll establish your plans. It's not, hey Lord, will you be committed to what I'm doing? Most of us read it like that. They're like, I'm going to do this, and Jesus, just come along and bless this thing. It's the wrong way around. That's not what that verse means. It's the other. It's like, hey, Lord, is this what you want me to do? I give this over to you. Do what you will with it, and he'll establish the plans. He then establishes those things. It's a complete dependence on God. As Ian shared, such a cool picture in the beginning there. You've got the name of Christ written on your heart. And if you don't, if you don't know Jesus, if, you've, if you're not sure that that is the one who has put his stamp on you so that when you get lost, we know where to return you. If you don't know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to make that decision today, to make that choice tonight, to go, hey, Lord, enough. I remember the day I got saved. That was the cry of my heart. I'm at the end of myself, Lord. I can no longer do this on my own. I've come to the end. I need you. I give myself completely to you. And God used me from that day. I was even more useless than an ox goad. And God, I wasn't even a pointy stick. I was just a stick. A blunt one. Still a bit blunt, but anyway. But I want to challenge you, friends. Let today be the day where you go, Lord, I'm done. I'm done trying on my own. You come and operate the windsurfer today. You come and show me how to run that thing, Lord, and I'll be available for you. And then comes the fun part of being obedient and actually going and doing what God calls you to do. Because that is exhilarating and life-giving and fulfilling. You might think like, man, Mike, how long have you been working? How long did you work for? you? 42 years of working. And you think, man, God's got him handing out Christmas presents on a Saturday morning. But he's changing lives. One little child at a time. And he's more alive than I ever see him. When I see him at the crash, he's more alive and more in charge than ever. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Because he's being the ox goat. He's being used by God. He's being useful. At a small crash in the back of Duku Duku that nobody sees. Where they got clear view fencing and solar borehole. And it's incredible. Because God, he's just going, this is what I've got. I'll use it. And he's alive. I want to be like that. Don't you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can be useless and still be used by you, God. I thank you that our inadequacy, our our insufficiency will not stop you from using us, Lord. I thank you that no matter how broken and imperfect we are, Lord, no matter how damaged we are, that you restore, you redeem, and you can reuse us over and over again, God. Jesus, I thank you that you are our great and perfect example. And so I pray that you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and lead us into that place of being completely reliant on God. 
of being those who are willing to lay down our lives completely and go wherever you will call us to go, Lord God, whether that be to our family, to our neighbors, or to other nations, Lord. We want to be those who are completely abandoned, fools for your kingdom, Jesus, living our lives radically and recklessly abandoned to the call of God. Father, I pray that you would break us out of our complacency and our self-reliance, Lord. I pray that you would set us on a path that is wild and free, where we live in a place that we need to be bold and strong and courageous every day because you have called us to things that are far beyond what we can accomplish on our own. Help us, God, to be completely reliant on you each and every day for everything that you call us. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.